Good morning, everyone. My name is Pekan Gupta. I'm a solutions architect at Smart Modeler Technologies. And today I'm going to present something about persistent memory or storage, flash storage solutions and which one to use and why. Let's start our discussion with the different types of data and where this kind of data or information is used. From a higher point of uh, level view, the data can be classified into three different spaces. A temporal data. Let's start with that. In a daily routine, we tend to memorize certain informations like street addresses, uh, computer passwords, breakfast recipes. This information is used frequently, but if you forget it, it can be easily reconstructed or someone will remind you. These are analogous to your temporal data stored in your L3 or L4 cache. Such data is frequently used, but it can also be recovered by reprobing the hardware or fetching from the disk and therefore it makes sense to keep it in the volatile memory. Now let's look at the other type of data, which is the information like your holiday shopping list. It can be also your 12 digit number of, of your mail tracking or a list of action items from a recent customer meeting. Such kind of information is usually a result of an intermediate stage of operation, or it can be a part of your unfinished task. This type of data is frequently updated, but it's difficult to regenerate it from the scratch. Therefore, it's important to save such data on a non-volatile persistent memory, it, like a handwritten sticky note, so that updates can be recovered if you forget it. This helps you to continue from wherever you or others left. This type of data is good for persistent memory applications. We'll discuss more about this in future slides. The last type of data which you see on the third column on the rightmost side is a static information. It can be like your family pictures, ledger or any other financial document, contracts or legal documents or just an old movie or song which you liked. This type of data is write once and read multiple times. We call it warm data. It's not frequently accessed, but it also cannot be recreated or reconstructed easily. So it should be stored permanently and securely. Such type of data is usually stored on storage servers, on SSDs, hard disk drives, or a large pool of uh, any other storage disk. Thus, it's important to understand that the frequency of how you access the data, how fast you access the data, the type of granularity of uh, in the way you access the data, and most importantly, the characteristic of data, whether it's easy to re regenerate or difficult, decide, determines the location where the data is stored. Now let's map the location of the data in the actual hardware world in different types of memory devices. There are three categories of memory devices in the market today. Let's start from the left, the volatile memory modules. These include standard JDAC, DDR4, and DDR5 memory DIMMs, which are connected to CPU uh, via parallel bus. And in recent times, we are also seeing volatile memory connected to CPU through cache coherent serial interfaces like uh, CXL or OpenCAPI OMI based memory modules. But the purpose is same. They all store temporal data. So this type of module should adhere to requirements like low latency, byte level or crash level granular access. And in addition to that, they should be highly reliable. Reliability is a key requirement for all memory modules because even a single bit of error uh, or a data corruption can actually bring down the entire system and leave security loopholes. The capacity of volatile memory devices is capped around hundreds of GB, and this is primarily because of the PCB real estate and power and thermal con constraints. Another type of memory devices which we see in the market are persistent memory devices. The major feature which differentiates them from standard memory uh, volatile memory modules is 
the ability to preserve the data across power cycles. They follow the same requirements of a standard memory module like low latency, uh, byte level or cache level granular access, and the few examples of persistent memory modules which are available today are NVDIMM-N DIMMs or Intel Optane persistent memory DIMMs. There may be persistent memory devices in future which are connected through CXL or OpenCAPI buses. Again, the capacity of the persistent memory devices available today is limited by the media density, the PCB real estate constraints and power and thermal constraints. On the right hand side, we have a third category of memory or devices or the storage devices. These are high density or high capacity SSDs or HDDs. These devices store data permanently. The important aspect is since the data stored on these devices is infrequently accessed or infrequently updated, a longer latency block level access is acceptable. But these kind of devices need high performance for bulk data transfers because in order to store a large amount of data in single burst, they need to have high performance for sequential accesses. Another important aspect is the cost. In order to bring down the cost of data stored on these high density or high capacity modules, the capacity of these storage modules should scale from a few terabytes to even petabytes in future. Now let's focus on the middle aspect, which is the persistent memory devices. It has the key benefits of both sides, the memory, volatile memory modules and persistence like a storage module. Let's look at some of the key advantages first. The data retention uh, across power cycles does have a value bit because it helps you reboot the system or bring up the system quickly uh, in case of an unmanaged or un unplanned shutdown. This reduces your downtime, but it also helps you to limit the blast radius during a surprise event like a system crash. Blast radius is a term usually used for determining the impact to overall system or other services in case of an surprise event like in power loss or a system crash. Persistent memory can save that critical data in flight like uh, any incomplete database transactions or database states, um, configurations, uh, metadata which was not fully committed, and it helps you contain the blast radius by allowing or by avoiding the costly rollbacks. It can also help you avoid restores of the unfinished transactions and therefore bring up or recover the system from where it had left before a event. Another important uh, help of having a persistent memory in your system is it facilitates the debug of failure. Persistent memory devices can actually uh, preserve the event logs the error logs, security logs uh, in the real time better than a storage module. And therefore, it's easy to debug the last level granular details of what happened just before a system crash. However, persistent memory does have its own challenges. Retention of the data on a media without power leaves a security loophole. It's easy for a malicious user to take the secure data out of your system by just removing the persistent memory module physically from your server and uh, re-engineering it. Therefore, it's very important that all the data stored on the persistent memory should be fully encrypted and securely erased. There's a complete white paper from SNIA on persistent memory hardware threat models. Mm. Uh, I have provided the link in the footnote and I recommend everyone who is working on the security aspect of persistent memory to refer it. Cost becomes another challenge for persistent memory because of the proprietary nature of the media and extra circuitry on the board to enable data retention. However, in most cases, uh, 
the benefit of pers having persistent memory overshadows the cost aspect. Lastly, reliability is another key requirement for all major devices. But reliability is for a persistent memory also depends on the memory architecture and how it is implemented. We'll see that in some of the next slides. Now, let's focus on different types of persistent memory architectures. There are two types of architectures as shown in this picture. On the left hand side, we see a persistent memory implemented with a DRAM along with a backup power and NAND. This type of architecture is used in NVDIMM dash N type of uh, memory modules. From a host perspective, the read and write accesses directly hit the volatile DRAM. But when the pow abrupt power loss happens, the non-volatile controller takes over and switches the power from a host provided power to a battery backed up or a super cap based backup power. The non-volatile controller then copies the data from volatile DRAMs in, and stores it into the NAND flash along with encryption the, encrypting the data on the fly. When power is restored, the data is copied back from NAND flash into the DRAM. This ensures that the information is preserved across the power cycle and host can restart from where it left. Now look, let's look, compare it with the architecture on the right hand side. The, uh, the architecture on the right hand side is something we call, can call it as persistent memory architecture using non-volatile proprietary media, uh, like we see in Intel Optane persistent memory DIMMs. This architecture does not require a backup power as the media itself uh, is capable of retaining the data when power is lost. However, due to the proprietary nature of the media itself, uh, the controller has to be proprietary because it has to manage buffering, address decoding, and protocol, protocol conversion depending on the type of media technology used on the backend. There are different examples or types of persistent media backends. Um, for example, Magneto resistive RAMs, which are MRAMs, uh, ferroelectric RAMs like FRAMs, and various types of phase change memory technologies, which have been customized for proprietary implementations. Now let's compare the two type of architectures uh, in terms of features. On the left, we have the DRAM backup power, and on the right, we have, um, which is more like a uh, non-volatile proprietary media based persistent memory. Both these architectures provide low latency, but performance of non-volatile media-based uh, persistent memory depends a lot on the underlying media technology, which is, again, proprietary in nature. Both these architectures allow byte level granular access and can retain the data across power cycles. So they are, they meet the bare minimum requirement of being persistent memory, but they differ on reliability because the endurance of the media depends on the technology implementation. Persistent memory architecture, uh, as shown on the left, which uses the DRAM with backup power, uh, uses DRAM as its main media. So it has practically infinite endurance. And NAND flash is only used during backup operations, which happen infrequently during a lifetime of a device. Thus, uh, persistent media implemented with DRAMs and backup power, like in NVDIMM-N, has a long lifetime um, from a product perspective. perspective. The reliability or the lifetime of a non-volatile media-based persistent memory depends on endurance of the backend media. There are techniques to increase the reliability and lifetime by wear leveling the media or spreading the writes across the uh, media, but it also uh, impacts the performance of the product or the persistent memory module as a whole during peak load conditions. These are some of the key features which should be kept in mind in while choosing the right type of persistent memory architecture for your applications. However, just to note, uh, non-volatile media-based persistent memory does have a benefit because of high capacity uh, and high densities 
available today. Persistent memory can be uh, or is available in variety of form factors. However, we, we do see persistent memory in mostly dim type of form factors like NVDIMM-N and Intel Optane persistent memory dims. But in, the, in no time, we will also see persistent memory sitting behind a CXL bus in an EDSFF form factor. Uh, we call ECXL based persistent memory solutions, which are implemented as DRAM with backup as NVXMMs due to its architectural similarity with NVDIMM-Ns. Lastly, uh, what you see on the right hand side is our few implementations of persistent memory available in PCI chem form factor. The biggest benefit of uh, having persistent memory implementations in this kind of a form factor is the scalability as DIMMs are independent field replaceable units of FRUs user can source the memory DIMMs from different vendors or uh, in different capacities and they can also replace the DIMM at the end of its lifetime or endurance cycle this extends the life of the overall product and gives better return of investment from a hardware standpoint now let's look uh, at the persistent memory programming model and compare it with standard block storage device. I will not deep dive into the difference between the two models because there are numerous presentations and videos on this topic as well. But in nutshell, you can uh, run a standard block based IO through file system layer on a persistent memory module. You may be able to get a better latency uh, or a lower latency and a better performance than the fastest SSDs using a persistent memory uh, model. But the best performance of a persistent memory is visible when you use it over a PM aware file system or a file system with DAX option enabled. This allows uh, applications to skip the intermediate operating system layers where data is copied from one buffer to another and allows applications to directly write the data to the uh, persistent memory module at cache level granularities. This gives the best performance uh, for any device. So to summarize, while you are selecting a persistent memory module or a device for your system, I recommend following three uh, steps. First, identify critical data which is not easily reproducible and is important to limit the blast radius in case of an abrupt power shutdown or a system uh, crash. This type of data is a good candidate to be stored on a persistent memory. Step two, identify the peak load conditions. That means how frequently would you use this data in a peak traffic and how uh, what are the critical applications which depend on this data? Step three, choose the right architecture and the form factor depending on uh, the type of use cases for your persistent memory. With this, I hope you learn something new about the persistent memory and storage solutions. And I conclude my presentation. Hope you liked it. Uh, please take a moment to rate this session. Thank you.